Arts providing grants uh, from us for us. Uh, today we have Dante Di Stefano, who should have been here in person last spring, but of course couldn't be because of uh, uh, COVID nineteen. Anyway, Dante is the author of Angels and Love is a Stone and a Dream Flight. He has the best titles of any person I've ever seen. His poetry, essays, and reviews have appeared in American Life and Poetry, Best American Poetry 2018, Poem a Day, Prairie Schooner, The Swanee Review, The Writer's Chronicle, and elsewhere. Along with Maria Isabel Alvarez, he co-edited the anthology, Misrepresented People, Poetic Res Responses to Trump's America. He holds a PhD in English Literature from Binghamton University and is a poetry editor for Dialogist. He teaches high school English in Endicott, New York, and lives in upstate New York with his wife, Christina, their daughter, Luciana, and their dog, dog Sonny. Uh, he's a wonderful poet, a wonderful essayist, and somebody I'm, I think that you will be very happy to hear. Let's welcome Dante DiStefano. Thank you, Maria, and thanks for everybody for being here and, and, and participating in this poetry reading. I want to thank Maria, my great teacher, um, and also the other people at the Poetry Center, Smita Desai, Susan Balick, and everybody else who makes things run smoothly at that great institution. So I'm really happy to be here with you, and I'm going to read some poems from some of my different books and talk to you a little bit about poetry, but I'm going to start with a poem by Amiri Baraka, and it's called Preface to a 20-Volume Suicide Note. And this is a poem that I memorized a long time ago when I was maybe 18. Um, and in recent years, it's become much more important to me because of having, um, because of the birth of my daughter. So Preface to a 20-Volume Suicide Note. Lately, I've become accustomed to the way the ground opens up and envelops me each time I go out to walk the dog or the broad edge silly music the wind makes when I run for a bus. Things have come to that. And now each night I count the stars and each night I get the same number. And when they will not come to be counted, I count the holes they leave. Nobody sings anymore. And then last night, I tiptoed up to my daughter's room and heard her talking to someone. And when I opened the door, there was no one there, only she on her knees, peeking into her own clasped hands. So that is Amiri Baraka's preface to a 20 volume suicide note. And I'm going to end this reading with some poems about my daughter but I'm going to kind of go through my work chronologically. And I'm going to start with my first book, which is called uh, Love is a Stone, Endlessly in Flight. Uh, the title of that book comes from a William Carlos Williams poem. Um, but I'm just gonna read uh, one poem from this. It's called Another Epic. And there's a great sonic by, sonnet by the Irish poet, um, Patrick Cavanaugh. And in this sonnet called Epic, he compares a local uh, argument um, to the Iliad, a local argument in Ireland to, to the Iliad. So the, this is called Another Epic. I have lived in important places, times, Patrick Kavanaugh. And I should say also before I read this, there's a couple of names in here. Masti Huba was a kind of a famous hobo in the town of Binghamton, New York, a kind of a local a colorful figure from my um, grandparents' time, but um, he makes an appearance in this poem. So another epic. I could tell you everything that happened on Linden Street, the year the Berlin Wall fell. That was the year the Hanrahan boy grew his hair to the middle of his back and rode his bike down the block at 7 a.m. sharp every school day. The Perry twins with red hair longer than the Hanrahan boys vied for the affections of Dino Taglione, and the older girl won. The pipes burst on 20 Linden, and we lost the love letters my grandmother had bundled in hat boxes and stored in a corner of the cellar. Masti Huba 
danced for Lucy's and beer in front of the Brickyard Tavern all summer, and somebody kept stealing the copper gutters off St. Mary's rectory roof. Monsignor Burgandi kept replacing them, and he would curse and pray as he paced the block throughout all the high holy days of ordinary time, like Achilles in his tent. All right, so those of you who were in the workshop I ran this morning, uh, we did some poems about uh, our, our reading life. And this is one of the poems that I wrote about my reading life called Reading Rilke in Early Autumn. Rainer Maria Rilke being the famous uh, early 20th century uh, German language poet. Reading Rilke in Early Autumn. It is a joy before the trees begin their turning to leaf through the paperback and to meet again the many angels whispering their secrets inside a man. It might almost make you want to be 18 and angry again, alone in your twin bed, yearning for the hot mouth of a girl, nights that unfolded like the long letters you wished you could compose if you lived in a distant, snowy, mispronounced city. But here you are, sitting in your classroom, upstate, in early middle age, a rose under your eyelids, while from the window, a breeze prowls up, a panther in your brain. And these are poems from my book, Ill Angels, which is my most recent book. This poem is called Reading Dostoevsky at 17. And even if you've never read Dostoevsky, um, the main thing you should know about him is that uh, he's a great writer of great intensity. He wrote about, uh, you know, wrote with great passion about um, the political and religious landscape of 19th century Russia. Um, and one of the characters in his famous novel, The Brothers Karamazov, is mentioned here. And his name is Dmitry Karamazov. And he's a person who loves, but loves in a kind of self-dramatizing way, which is to say he doesn't really know how to love, which is also to say in some ways, he loves the way we all love when we're teenagers. So I read this book when I was a teenager, and this poem is kind of trying to like excavate that world of being a teenager for myself in some ways. Reading Dostoevsky at 17. In those days, my dreams always changed titles before they were finished, and I wanted only to love in that insane, tortured way of poor, dear Dmitry Karamazov. Suddenly, I was speaking the language of lapdog and samovar. This is the ballroom, the barracks, the firing squad, this is the old monk with the beard of bees. This is the orange lullaby, the moon of the moon will sing you when it's grieving. This is the province you escape by train, fleeing heavy snow and eternal elk. This is the part where I take your hand in my hand and I tell you, we are burning. So this poem is a poem that I don't think I could have written uh, without Maria Gillen as my teacher. And it's a poem in which I explore uh, loss and grief. Um, in, in, it's, it's a poem where I talk about um, the most profound loss in my wife's life, which was the loss of her mother when she was a young woman. So this, and her mother died of glioblastoma, a type of brain cancer. So this poem is dedicated to my, fa my father-in-law, and it's called Einstein's Sparrow. There is the simple fluency of air to contend with, the way the wind will mouth, amen, 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 until your grief turns to water or a current of ash. And then in twilight, you are dreaming bones in the shape 
the body you once knew and loved and married yourself to always. Only time has turned into a silken triangle tucked in your shirt pocket. Your great grandmother folded her linens in the same way 100 years ago. Your father's love letters to your mother were folded thus and lost in a basement. But you did not wed yourself to this shape or that garment. You wed yourself to flight. Albert Einstein dreamt of the perfect wing in Zurich long before the Luftwaffe, the cattle cars, and the atomic bomb. His wing had nothing to do with all that, or Newton for that matter. It was light from a star bent by the sun's gravity. When the sickness came, she stayed bedridden until the end. The dog with big doe eyes looked on from the corner. Angel statues and tiny glass birds looked on from the shelves. You massaged her feet because they hurt. Her whole body was valved in pain. And there was no breeze to disguise this suffering, no way to call this holy or keep times bending away from her. Sometimes death is a room, you thought, with one unpainted patch on the ceiling to stare at. If only a sparrow would come to the windowsill to threshold a song. If only the statuary of the dying were more than mere filaments of braided smoke. Answer is the arrow breaking apart in the body. It is flint, the flint tip of the arrow sparking as it hits rib. It is what the arrow knows in its arc, what the air whistles to its atoms. All of science, the universe, this hour proves itself in doubt. The dream of a wing made perfect, held in the part of her mind that had not succumbed to the more light of last breath. And there is no need to, no way to recall her pupils then, flitting from side to side, become a shadow of sparrow over the graveyard, over your own wedding day. The next poem, also from Ill Angels, is a poem dedicated to Maria Maziati Gillen, and it's a poem titled Dante, and it came from a conversation I had with Maria about my name and where my name came from, which is, uh, you know, my, my name, Dante, obviously I'm named after the Italian poet Dante Alighieri, and when my great grandfather came from Sicily, Stefano, uh, one of the things he brought with him was a copy of the Divine Comedy, which one of my aunts still has to this day. So, um, so I was writing about that history, but I was also thinking about Maria's history as the daughter of immigrants. And so a lot of her things from her poetry um, comes into this too. Dante. From Maria Maziotti Gillen. When you hear the name, think of a red book, think of golden edged pages, think of waves whose crests touch heaven, think enduring, think of green letters crayoned on loose leaf, think of a hooded bust with hooked nose, think of Dore etching countless demons. When you hear the name, think of a hand raised in benediction. Think of a wound bound by light. Think of your own mother's face, then in any season when she was young. Think of your own name bicycling beside you and engrailing your words like veering stars. When you hear the name, think of your father. Think of silk factories in Patterson. Think of shoe factories and half-finished skyscrapers in New York. Think of diners and post offices and railway cars where immigrants built dreams of apple orchards. When you hear the name, think of a mirror, think of Italian women wearing black dresses, think of zucchini flowers fried in garlic and olive oil, think kitchens where your grandmother hobbled, wearing red, singing arias to the Milky Way. When you hear the name, think of your husband, think of your wife, Think of how love and death thread together as inextricably as strands of DNA. 
Think of the wall of fire you have to pass through at the end of a poem. Think of a pelican dying in an oil spill. Think of a bright red flag snapped in the face of forgetting. Think sex, its nightgowns and awkward glory. Think of Beatrice, Sordello, Virgil, Ave Maria's throating the twilight. When you hear the name, think of the poets and think of your ancestors who carried the name on the spine of the only thing they brought across the Atlantic Ocean. They carried the commedia in their hands and the cantos on their tongues. In their hearts, Paolo and Francesca rode the whirlwind. If I was in New Jersey right now, um, I, would, uh, I would happily read um, several poems that I've written about Patterson. And I think I'll read a couple um, right here about William Carlos Williams. And they're more reading poems. Um, and the, the first one is called Reading William Carlos Williams in My Early 20s, which is really important to me as a young poet to read Williams and to see the way uh, he, uh, he uses images to drive his poems forward. Um, and uh, so this poem is addressed to my wife, but addressed to my wife at, from a time period way before I knew her. So, reading William Carlos Williams in my early 20s. There was something urgent I had to say to you, but you were not there as I talked on against time. The rivers schooled me then. The falls fell upward. I kept a marble composition notebook. The moon skilled me. I diagrammed sunlight. I studied brick and spider web with equal attention. The green in me kept reaching for bloom. The world threatened to turn the lily's throat into hummingbird, the apple blossom into a thousand tropics, my own want into a squall of goldenrod pollen. I didn't know the gaunt vowels I caught in the air then. I'd reshape as your name. And the companion poet to that, there's some images in here that seem strange, like a tapestry on which unicorns are depicted, but those are images from uh, William's poems. So reading William Carlos Williams in my late 30s, also a poem to my wife. The urgent some things I've needed to say still buck like woven unicorns inside a tapestry we have seen and unmade together. There is nothing so good as waking up beside you while your almond blossom dreams are unfolding and you curl your body into a graceful query of the sunlight coming in through the blinds. You dab my wing with scarlet and set it into flight each morning. You make a mass of stretching and rising a ceremony for greeting dawn in all its brute splendor. I love our life, the ordinariness, the routine sprung, verging on cardinal. All right. The next poem is a poem from the anthology, What Saves Us, edited by Martina Spada. And Maria Gillen has some lovely poems in that anthology as well. I highly recommend it. I'm going to read one of the poems I have in here called Cradle Song, which is for Luciana, my daughter, when she was one month old. Cradle Song. One squall from your tawny body, fevered in the night, outweighs an electorate, undoes the disgust that knots up my throat with talk of power, and its founding fathers. You're not the first to come into a world where bad men bleed the meek, lie about it, and smile. Burrow deeper into my shirt, arching bluebell of my most hopeful hour. For far too few years, I know you'll be safe in our home. But after that, your nation will try to teach you its collateral vocabularies of shackle, and pledge. Don't learn them. Your birthright is no baton. Don't wield it. Speak in it. 
this broken hymn. This lullaby your father sings for you, made of spindrift love and rage and larkspur. All right, the next poem is from a book that I'm just finished. It doesn't have a publisher yet, but it's called Lullaby with Incendiary Device. And it's really a book about my daughter and, um, and also about kind of, um, you know, this, the, the pressure exerted by the last four years of our national life, which has been almost impossible culminating in this pandemic, these pandemics. Um, but so this poem that I'm going to read you is called My 18-Month-Old Daughter Talks to the Rain as the Amazon Burns. And I start with a quote from Miguel Hernandez, the great Spanish poet. I highly recommend his poetry. Um, he died in one of uh, Franco's jails. Um, but uh, he wrote this poem called Lullaby of the Onion. And it's a beautiful, one of the most beautiful poems ever written, translated beautifully by Robert Bly. Um, and it's a poem that he wrote to his, his, uh, his son and his wife when his wife had written him a letter while he was in jail. And she had told him that all they had to eat were onions. So he wrote back this poem, Lullaby of the Onion. And uh, the lines I quote from it in English are, Lark of my house, keep laughing. My 18-month-old daughter talks to the rain as the Amazon burns. This little lark says hi to the rain. She calls river as she slaps the air with both wings. She doesn't know pine from ash or cedar from linden. She greets drizzle and downpour alike. She doesn't know iceberg from melt. Can't say sea level rise, glacial retreat. Doesn't know wildfire greenhouse gas, carbon tax, or emission, does not legislate a fear she can't yet feel, only knows cats and birds and small dogs and the sway of some tall trees make her squeal with delight. It shakes her tiny body, this thrill of the live electric sudden, the taste of wild blueberries on her tongue, the ache of thorn prick from blackberry bush. Oh, dear girl, Look here, there's so much to save. Moments, ladybugs, laughter, trillium, blue jays, arias, horizons, pink hue. We gather lifetimes on one small petal. The rivers, our friend, the world, and Adam. Daughter, another name for hope, rain. Change begins when you hail the sky, sun, and wind, the verdure inside your hearts, poor chambers, even garter snakes and unnamed insects in the underbrush, as you would a love that river. Hi. All right. And um, so this, this next one, um, well, this I wrote, this is the, this, this is one I wrote about my daughter and my wife too. Um, and I think this will be the last one that I read. Um, and it's a poem that I wrote during National Poetry Month last year. It's called Notes to Myself during National Poetry Month 2020. And of course, we were all quarantined by that point. Um, and, um, so it's kind of about that, and it's kind of a reminder to myself of what poetry is and can be and should be in our lives, in my life in particular, which is a, a way uh, uh, of surviving, right? The most necessary way of surviving um, and a way of engaging the world. Um, um, in, in, in all of its beauty and nuance and terror and ugliness. Um, so this is my last poem for you. And I hope that you all um, 
are safe and happy and as well as you can be in these troubling times and that you turn to poetry as a source for strength and hope and light and understanding. Notes to myself during National Poetry Month 2020. Remember, bluets still sprout beneath your boots when you take your daughter for a walk by the river. Even though an orange snow fence surrounds the jungle gym in the park down the street, there's the low fork of a young oak to sit her in. Remember, even if the hoops have all been unscrewed from the backboards, you can still feign a hook shot for her. Remember, if the balcony is closed, sing through the wall. Find the riot unquelled in the cherry blossom center. Remember, beneath each scarf, bandana, and surgical mask, there is a throat that might break into sudden, surprising aria. Remember how astonished your daughter is at motorcycles and ladybugs, a pebble she finds in a neighbor's driveway, the stars, the moon, mayflies, street lights seen from the window before bed. Remember the image of your wife's brown hair sprawled on the pillow in the blue hour of any morning is worth more than all your poems. Remember, even an angry word from her is worth more than the best line of poetry you have ever read. Remember, your poems cannot shelter you or make a roof for the ones you love. Remember, the Earth's sole vocation is to astonish. Remember, the angels of the Earth choir themselves with mouths full of sod. Remember, glaciers melt, oceans rise, coastlines recede. Remember, everything can happen at once and always, and God and heaven and hell. Remember, the world is inside you, the meadow between one clover and one bee. Remember, the world is sweet and spinning still. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think you need to turn your, uh, your mic on, Maria. Can't hear you. Oh, now you can hear me. All right. Yeah, what now I, I can. Yeah. Is that we need to give Dante a big round of applause for his wonderful reading, for his inspiring workshop, for his poems that seem to capture the light in the ordinary, the light in the extraordinary moments of our days, and and the beauty that we see around us, even amidst a lot of ugliness and hate. Uh, let's give him a big round of applause, please. He deserves it. And also join me in clapping for Sue Balick and Sweeney Desai, who have done an enormous amount of work to make this whole technology work of live streaming these uh, readings, which make the readings available to people across the country, and then they're on YouTube forever. So that's a wonderful thing. Thank you all. Thank you, Dante, for being an amazing poet. Thank you, Maria.